السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين uh, Welcome to another episode of the Maradiya Show where we're meeting people where they are I'm your host Shadid Muhammad uh, If you want to join me on the Zoom um, the ID is the same as it always is 624-674 three 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 zero six two four six seven four three 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 uh zero okay so uh today inshallah we're going to continue with um you know what we started with our conversation that we started with uh before and that was 10 ways to know if you are actually ready for marriage. Um, the first, the one that we covered, the first one we covered, number one, was that if you are not willing to make sacrifices, if you are not willing to make sacrifices, then that uh, may be a telltale sign that you are not ready for marriage. The goal of this discussion is not to discourage people from marriage. That is not the goal here. The goal is not to discourage people from getting married. The goal here is to um, the the goal here is to um, excuse me one second. The goal here is to make sure that um, people are aware of what they're getting into um, going into the institution of marriage. That is, that is the goal here. We want people to, you know, go into marriage, you know, having a full understanding of what they're getting themselves into. This is not just, I want to have sex with someone and I want to do right by Allah. And, you know, you might have great intentions. That might be well. You might have the best of intentions, but just having sincere intentions is not enough. You have to go about things the right way. All right, so we covered nope, the first one was that if you are not ready to make sacrifices, um, then you are not ready to be married because your marriage is going to be tested. And, you know, you're either going to go with the flow and make whatever necessary sacrifices you have to make for the greater good of your relationship or you are going to um, not make sacrifices, not be willing to make sacrifices and stand your ground. And, you know, you allow the chips to fall where they may. And, you, you know, you reap what you sow. The second um, quality or the second um, component here to know whether or not you are ready for marriage is that you have to be responsible. If you are not ready to be responsible, then you are not ready for marriage. And there's a few things that you need to be responsible with. As a matter of fact, I itemize them to six. Going into a marriage, there are six things that you need to be responsible. All right. That you have to be responsible for. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun That all of you are shepherds and all of you are responsible for your flocks. All of you are shepherds, and all of you are responsible for your flock. So, what are the things that you need to be responsible with? I'll itemize them. Give me one second. Okay. So, the ten things that you, uh, the six things that you need to be responsible with are. Give me one second. Um, number one, the mind. You need to be responsible for the intellect, the mentality, the mental state of the person that you are married to. You are responsible for that. You are responsible for the mental state of the person. You are responsible, obviously, for your own mental state, but you're also responsible for, you know, the mental state of the person that you are married to, not to damage the person you know, psychologically or intellectually or mentally more than, you know, maybe they already are, all right? We are, we are commanded in Islam to leave people better than the way we found them. Leave people better than the way that you found them. 
not to contribute to, you know, someone's, you know, you know, own mental health issues. Some people may come into marriages and they have their own mental health issues. Your job is not to contribute to that. Your job is to make their mental state better than the way that you found it. All right. Just like you need your intellect and your mental state to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to serve God, right? Which is why there are certain things that are haram in Islam, you know, to protect the intellect. Because you need your intellect to worship God. Hence the fact someone who has mental health illnesses to the point, severe mental health Ill illnesses, to the point where they cannot serve God, they are excused. They are excused. The Prophet sallallahu he said, Rufi al qalam an thalatha that the pin of accountability has been lifted from three people, and from amongst those three is al majnoon hatayyakin is the person that is majnoon, the person that is mentally unstable. All right, until they gain full use of their mental capacity, they're excused. They're not held accountable. So we need our intellect to serve God, and just like we need our intellect to serve Allah. We need our intellect to serve the interests of our marriage and to serve the interests of our spouse. We need that. And you are responsible for that. All right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun. All you who believe do not approach prayer in a drunken state where you don't understand what you're saying. Until you can understand what you're saying. This is a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to approach salah in a drunken state where you don't understand what you're saying. So alcohol or any intoxicant is haram, is forbidden in Islam because it alters the natural state of the mind which is needed to serve its creator. Not to mention that the aql, the intellect, is one of the five Basic necessities, duroriyat al khams, one of the five basic necessities that is, you know, that the whole sharia, the whole legislation of Islam has been sent to preserve. The legislation, all that we have of halal and haram and things that are recommended, things that are, you know, highly recommended, things that are not, you know, so good, things that are forbidden, all of those laws and rules revolve around five basic necessities. Pr preservation. Of five basic necessities. And one of those five is al aql, is the intellect. So you understand, you guys are you you are responsible for the mental state of the person that you are married to. If you believe that you are not responsible for someone else's mental state and not to contribute to someone else's, you know, um the lack of someone's you know mental well-being you believe that you are not responsible for that, then don't go into a marriage because you cannot imagine how much mental, psychological damage is done to people because they believe that they are not responsible for the mental well-being of the person they're in a relationship with. That's not my problem, you know. So meanwhile, a man or a woman, a woman can play mind tricks on a man the whole entire relationship because women, you guys are very good at that. Men are good at that as well, but women, you guys have mastered manipulation. You know how to manipulate. You know how to get what you want. And there are some men who know how to do that as well. Gaslighting, making the person believe that they are crazy when there's nothing wrong with them, but there's something inherently wrong with you. Gaslighting a person, making them believe that they don't, that they, they, they're seeing something that is actually not there. Or well, they're, not, they're not seeing something that is actually there. You have, and then, you know, get out of the relationship and say, man, that person crazy. Man, that woman is crazy. Guess who drove her crazy? <laughs> crazy. Crazy is as crazy does. And I hate to use the word crazy, but, you know, I'm saying this is the language that people use. Because crazy is, is a bit dismissive when you use it in that term. But I'm just trying to frame you know, the conversation in a language that we commonly use and that we understand. A woman will get out of a relationship with a man after she's manipulated him for years and then turn around and say, man, that dude is crazy. 
Man, that Negro was crazy. But guess who drove him crazy? Crazy? <laughs> guess who did that to him? Guess who contributed to that? Maybe he wasn't all there when you married him. Maybe he wasn't all there when he married him. And even if you married him and you knew he wasn't all there when you married him, then that says a lot about you as well. <laughs> because you married him. You had children with him. And then turn around and say, man, that dude is crazy. He's this, he's that. But guess what? He's the father of your children, crazy. <laughs> you had children with him. You were married to him for three, four, five years. <laughs> so what does that say about you? What does that say about you? So we, we have a responsibility not to play mind games on people and manipulate people and play with the minds of people so much so that they can't even, they can't serve us in the relationship and they can't serve anybody else. Right? You can't serve your relationship and you can't serve anybody else's. Think about how many brothers and sisters right now that have been in horrible marriages where there was emotional manipulation, mental manipulation, and after getting out of that situation, they are not fit mentally to go in any relationship afterwards. Right now, maybe sitting here listening to this right now saying, you know, are triggered right now because they hear me saying this. Think about how many people <laughs> have been mentally manipulated for years in their relationships and are not fit to go into a relationship now because you married someone who instead of making you better, enhancing your mental well-being, your mental state, they took advantage of it. You are responsible. And then we'll move on into the next relationship and do it to the next person and then off to the next person. Master manipulating your way until you get what you want. You are irresponsible. You are not ready. Not, you're not ready to be in any type of relationship because your agenda is self-serving and you will play with somebody's mind. You will manipulate someone until you can get what you want from them. God forbid you are using Allah's religion to do that. I want you guys to think about something right now. Think about the men and women who have been manipulated. Think about the men and women who have been in marriages and were manipulated using the religion and turn around and hate Islam because of the way that they were manipulated. Think about how many Muslim men and women hate Islam right now, abhor religion altogether because religion was used to manipulate them, to steal their agency. They don't even feel like they have enough confidence and control. You know what I mean? They don't have any confidence within themselves. They don't have any control over their mental well-being right now because they were in a relationship with someone who manipulated them using the religion to do that. Think about that and think about the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu and the type of people they became being married to the Prophet Sallallahu and him using the religion to make them better. Think about the women the Prophet Sallallahu was married to. Aisha became a scholar. She was married to a man and then he dies. Aisha was only 18 years old when the Prophet Sallallahu died. 18. And he went, she went on to become a great Islamic scholar. She became a doctor in a scholar in medicine. In medicine, Aisha wasn't just a scholar in Islamic sciences. She was a scholar even in medicine. And a woman cannot thrive and flourish like that other than the fact that the man that she was married to, it was a healthy relationship. Look at our women coming out of these marriages. They don't know if they're coming or going. <laughs> they don't know if they're coming or going. Women get out of these marriages and take off their hijab. 
Women get out of these marriages and go back to Christianity. Women get out of these marriages and don't know whether or not they want to be Muslim anymore. Women get out of these marriages and become feminists. Women get out of these marriages and become men haters. This is all due to the manipulation. You know what I mean? Like, you know, these women get out of these marriages and look how damaged they are. It's not like a woman got a divorce from a man. The situation didn't work. It was a healthy relationship. It just wasn't, you know, it wasn't conducive for her or for him. They separated. She moves on, find happiness in another relationship, find someone else to share her happiness with and moves on. Actually taking from her previous marriage or his previous marriage and being able to learn from that and grow. That was a healthy relationship. That was a healthy relationship. But you have people getting out of marriages today and are psychologically damaged. Psychologically damaged. And then they go into relationships with other people simply because they don't want to be alone and they cause damage to somebody else due to the damage that was done to them. Hurt people hurting people. Hurt people hurting other people, man. This is real. All because we did not see ourselves as being responsible. If you are in a marriage right now, if you're in a relationship with someone right now, you're in a marriage with someone right now, and you look at their mental well-being, look at their mental state, can they think for themselves? Can they make their own decisions? Can they think for themselves? Can they process in a healthy way? Meaning when incidents happen, things happen, conversations happen, they're able to process without using negative biases stemming from negative experiences that they've had with you previously? Are they thriving mentally? Are they able to make healthy connections and relationships with other people? Sociable? Are, are these the type of people that you that that you know that are in a relationship with you or when you look at the people that you are married to they are so um, self-conscious about everything about how they look about how they think about the decisions they make they're self-conscious about everything because of you you have made them self-conscious about everything are they able to make their own decisions are they able to process experiences in a healthy way without using negative biases to generalize all of the experiences. And that will tell you whether or not you want a healthy relationship or, an or you are providing a healthy environment for your spouse to grow mentally or you're providing a toxic environment, dysfunctional environment for your spouse to be stifled mentally, spiritually, you, you know, I mean, like you think about that. Only you can answer that question. But you are responsible for the mind, for the mental state of the person that you are married to. And if you see that when you're marrying someone, that their mental state is far beyond what you can, you know, withstand, then remove yourself from that situation. Realize that this is above your pay grade, that this is too much for you, too much for you can to you for you to handle. You understand? And you should be aware of this before you go into the marriage. Well, what about if you marry somebody and then you realize after marrying them, then you have a choice to either stay in that situation or remove yourself from that situation. You always have a choice. You always have a choice. But don't stay and contribute to, you know, you know, the, the horrible quality of life that they are experiencing. Don't contribute to that. If you stay then you leave the person better than what you found them. Not worse off than when you found them. You follow me? So you are responsible, number one, for the mental state of the person that you marry. You are responsible for the life of the person that you marry. Protection. You are responsible. And sometimes the people that our spouses need protection from is us. 
Sometimes your, your wife or your husband needs protection from you because the closer you are to someone, the more you have the ability to hurt them, which is why the people who hurt us the most are the people who say that they, they love us. The people who hurt us the most are usually the people who are closest to us because they have more access. They have more access, which is why the Prophet Wasallam said, al hamu al mot the brother-in-law to the, to the wife, the brother-in-law to his brother's wife is like death because there's no man that has access to that woman like his brother. So if I marry a woman, my brother is like death to my wife because he has access to her unlike any other man outside of her you know, immediate family. So the Prophet wasallam said, Al-Hamu Al-Mawt. The brother-in-law is like death. It's like slaughtering your wife, putting your wife in a situation where a strange man has access to her is like killing her. So you think about men, you know what I mean? Think about men who cuckolds, you know what I mean? They youth who allow their wives to go in environments, you know, with men, strange men, giving men access to their wives, right? And you're slaughtering your own wife. You're slaughtering your own wife. You're slaughtering your own husband. Women, sisters, stop giving other women access to your husband. The sister is single. And the sister says, you know, can I ride with you and your husband? Absolutely not. <laughs> you cannot ride with me and my husband. You understand? You don't get access to my husband. And if she says, oh, well, you're jealous, you're just afraid that I'm going to ask about your husband and I'm going to ask him to be in polygyny. Well, jealousy, the origin of jealousy is a fear. So, yes, I am jealous. Own that. Don't let nobody shame you into being, you know, oh, you're just jealous because you're afraid that I'm going to ask about your husband. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. Own that. Why do you let somebody shame you into doing something that you don't want to do? If you are, are uncomfortable with the sister riding with you and your husband, then say that. To hell with what she thinks. She's going to say, oh, well, you're just jealous. You're so insecure. I'll own all of that. You're not riding with me and my husband. <laughs> I'll own all of that. <laughs> but you're not riding with me and my husband. Not going to happen. I'll own that. I'll stand in that discomfort. But guess what? You will not be riding in the back seat with me and my husband exchanging glances through the rearview mirror with my husband. Not going to happen. You understand? Call the Uber with love. I love that. <laughs> call, the, call the Uber with love. Absolutely. I love it. Absolutely. The next thing you know, the husband come in. You know, he's so gully. He's so, you know, green around the ears. So what do you think about me marrying Khadija? It's like, what? Mary, that's my best friend. That's my best friend. But you know why? Because you gave Khadija access to your husband. You gave her ass, you gave her access. And she shouldn't have had access. You have a responsibility to protect the life of your spouse. Protect their lives. Don't put your spouse on the on the chopping block under the guise of friendship. We're besties. We're best friends. You know, la wallahi. La wallahi. We can be best friends, but you ain't got to have access to my spouse to prove that you're my best friend. And I don't have to give you access to my spouse to prove to you that I am your best friend. You understand? Protect the life of your spouse. And sometimes your spouse needs protection from you because sometimes we can be you know, not every single sister is thirsty for the same. No, not every sister, but you don't know who is. <laughs> Do you know? You don't know that the sister is thirsty until after your husband has already asked about her. You understand? So the fact that, that you don't know means that you don't give anybody that type of access. You don't tell your husband, oh, um, sister such and such pipe just broke. Could you go to her house and go down in the basement and fix her stuff? No, I don't send your husband down there. No, I'm not sending my husband over there. 
And the husband, we so green, inshallah, I'll go, because you want to be captain, save the sister. You know what I mean? You want to save the sister. No, I will call a plumber to come and assist you. <laughs> You're single at the moment, and I get that, but there's some things as a single woman that you have to handle by yourself. You don't put me in a jeopardizing situation. You have a right, you have a, a, a responsibility to protect me. To protect me. Sister, you have a, a responsibility to protect your husband. And as a brother, you have a responsibility to protect your wife. Give you another example on the flip side of that, where brothers will give students of knowledge access to their wives. This is my man. He's a student of knowledge. Inshallah, we're going to go give him some advice. Meanwhile, as a student of knowledge, he's attracted to your wife. And your wife is attracted to him because he can quote Quran. He can sound good with the Arabic. Mashallah. And all of that, Shaitan is playing on all of it. Next thing you know, your wife wants a khula from you, and now she's marrying the student of knowledge. That's real talk. Real talk. So many situations I know like this. And then you turn around and say, well, who am I going to go get advice from? First of all, if that is your man, that is your boy, and he's a student of knowledge, it is a conflict of interest anyway. You shouldn't be taking your wife. You shouldn't be getting advice from him anyway because it's a conflict of interest. It's a conflict of interest. What part of that don't we understand? I'm not going to go to my best friend about advice, especially if I know that he's a smoke blower. You understand? You know what a smoke blower is? Someone who's constantly blowing smoke underneath your stove. He's not a person that is a straight shooter. It's a difference if a person, you know, this is my man, but I know that this guy don't cut corners. He's going to tell you like it is, whether he love you or whether he hates you. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Which is what? Which is the way that we should be anyway? Which is the way that we should be anyway? The Prophet Sallallahu used to make dua. He said, وَأَسْأَلُكَ كَرِمَةً حَقْ بِالْغَضَبِ وَالْرِضَى And I ask you the ability to say the truth whether I am angry with the person or whether I'm pleased with the person. That is what we should all be striving towards. We should all be striving towards that. But not everybody has that. But I'm not going to go to my friend, student of knowledge, who I know is not really a straight shooter, especially when it comes to me. I'm not going to go to him for advice about me and my wife. I'm not going to do that. Because it's a conflict of interest. He's going to give me advice based upon his placating my feelings. Based upon his relationship with my feelings. He doesn't want to see me hurt. So he's going to give me information that's going to placate my feelings. I don't want my feelings placated. I want you to give me the truth of the situation. And if you can't do that, then maybe I need to go to someone who I don't necessarily have a relationship with that can be a straight shot and give it to me exactly the way that I need it. But you have a responsibility to protect your wife. Protect the life. You put your wife on the slaughtering block. You go to the imam's office. He quoting all this unnecessary Arabic. And I mean, like, as a man, you sitting there and you're listening to him. You saying, like, this dude throwing it on extra thick because my wife is here. And as a man, you got to be able to spot that. You go into the brother for advice. You know him. And then when he starts talking, he's spitting all this Arabic. The sheikh said, and there's a difference of opinion and blah, 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 blah. And breaking it down. And, you know, your wife is like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. See, that's what I told him. You know what I mean? And at that very moment, you know, there's this attraction. She's already vulnerable because you and her are at odds for whatever reason. There's already a vulnerability there. There's already a vulnerability there. I have turned brothers down for marriage counseling when I was doing marriage counseling because I know you and your wife, I'm, I'm not comfortable. You might want to go to somebody else. I'm not going to do that. Oh, come on, Shane. You know, we just need some. No, I'm not going to do that. You need to go see somebody else because me and you are cool. So possibly your wife may already think that I'm placating your feelings because you're my man. I'm not doing that. Go see someone else. Not to mention that most students of knowledge are not marriage counselors. <laughs> most, if not all, of the students of knowledge are not marriage counselors. So why are you going to them 
for a 10, 15, 20 year marriage that you done invested in, you're going into this, you know, in inexperienced, unqualified individual to give you marital advice. You see how that works? Like, I don't even understand why he's an option. Because he's a student of knowledge? You don't go, you know, for, you need to have a heart surgery. You don't go to a pediatrician for heart surgery. Yeah, a pediatrician is a doctor, but not the type of doctor that you need. Yes, he's a student of knowledge, but he may not be qualified or skilled in the particular area that you need. Just because he's a student of knowledge does not mean he's qualified to speak about every single issue. And unfortunately, many students of knowledge don't have the humility, right, that is necessary to say to the person that is beyond me, that is above my head, you need to go see someone else. They don't. They just take it all on, not realizing the responsibility that they are. I mean, you can't imagine how many students of violence that I know personally who have been responsible for the destruction of people's marriages. You can't imagine how many students of knowledge, imams that I know personally who has been responsible for the destruction of somebody's marriage. And you got to carry that. Yo, Makiyama. You got to an answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You broke up an entire family based upon pure ignorance. Pure ignorance. And you have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. How do you answer those children who were five, six, four, five, six years old when you told their parents they were divorced based upon some one-sided you know, information they gave you? How do you respond to those children 20 years later when that child is 26, 27, have gone through years of their parents being separated, trying to process all of that? How do you explain to that child at 27 years old that you were the one that was responsible for separating their entire family? How do you answer somebody like that? How do you answer, how do you answer for that? that he spent his entire life processing the divorce, processing the divorce of their mother and father and only to reach adulthood and come across you as an imam finding out that you were the one who issued the fatwa, you were the one who issued the ruling, you were the one who gave them, you know, well, Sheikh Obeid said or Sheikh Fulan said, and these sheikhs are not qualified in marital issues either. They're not qualified in speaking about marital issues either. And quiet is kept. When you look at some of the some of their marital situations, it's not stable anyway. They're not qualified in any way, shape, or form to give any rulings related to your particular marriage. Marriage in general, maybe. You read Sahih al-Bukhari, you read Muslim, you read the Muslim of Imam Ahmed, you got some hadith here and there. Okay, that's in general. But to sit down with a couple and to begin sorting through their marital issues, that takes a particular skill set that you are not qualified in. You're not. So you are responsible for the life of your partner. The physical life, the emotional life, the mental life, you are responsible for that. Do not put your spouse in a situation where they end up losing their lives spiritually, emotionally, you know, physically to put your life in danger. Personally, me as, as a man, there are certain massages that I would not take my wife or not take my family to, period. Period. Because I have a responsibility to protect her. I have a responsibility to protect my children. All right, so if you are not ready to be responsible for the mind, the mental state, you are not responsible, you're not ready to be responsible for the life of your spouse, the wealth. Number three, you are responsible for the wealth of your spouse. And this is a huge, huge discussion. What does it mean to be responsible for the wealth of your spouse? So for women, very serious, very important, you are responsible for the wealth of your husband. 
Your husband gets up and he goes and he works very hard and makes the money. It's your responsibility not to spend that money irresponsibly. It's your responsibility not to spend that wealth irresponsibly. That, that is a responsibility that is on your shoulders. Mesfuria, you're going to be asked about how you spend the wealth of your husband. You're going to be asked about how you spend the wealth of your ex-husband. If you receive child support or if, your child, if the father of your children, your ex-husband, gives you money for his children. And then you take that money and you go spend it on things that are either not related to the children or related to the children, but not something that the father, you know, actually approves of. You understand? I'll give you an example. And this is a real example. The ex-husband gives uh, his ex-wife money for his children, his sons, right? The ex-husband has a certain standard of living that his children are used to or that he would like his children to enjoy. So he gives her the money based upon that. So if he gives you $150 for you to go buy his son some Jordans, specifically he told you that this is the type, you know, the, the, the child's father, this is the type of, this is how he dresses his children. This is like how he wants his children to dress. He can afford it. So he gives you $150 for you to go buy him some sneakers. And then you say to yourself, oh, that's dunya. I'm not buying. I'm not spending $150 on a pair of sneakers. And you go buy him some bobos, you know what I mean, from wherever for $20. And you pocket the rest. And then his father comes to pick his son up and sees the bobos on his son's feet. Like, why are you wearing those? I gave your mother almost $200 to go get you a pair of sneakers. I don't know. This is what my mother bought me. That's not your place, man. It's not your place to decide. I don't want my children being involved with dunya. I don't want my. That's not your place. Allah subhanahu wa taala says in the Quran, "Wa al mauludi lahum lahunna al al mauludi lahu rizquhunna wa kiswa tuhunna bil maruf." It is upon the father of the child to provide food and clothing to the woman for the child and for her if she's still going through the divorce period, the, the period, based upon what is ma'roof, based upon what he can afford, what is reasonable for him, not reasonable for you. That's his responsibility, not yours. You don't have to say, well, I'm not buying that. I'm going to buy this. You, understand? you guys follow me. You have a responsibility. Now, if you feel that the shoes that he's buying, you know, you don't want your child to become materialistic and put so much emphasis on materialism, then that is a conversation that you have with the father. You do not take it upon yourself to say, well, I don't want my children being materialistic. Well, I don't want my children, you know, spending all this money on this haram. Nah, that's haram for you because you're broke. If your husband can handle that, your husband can afford that then it's not haram. How is that haram? To spend $150 on a pair of sneakers and $150 to him is like a drop in the bucket. It's nothing. $150 to you because you don't have a job or because you, you're living off of somebody else. $150 to you is a lot of money. $150 to him is not a lot of money. Don't superimpose on someone else the standards of living that you have chosen for yourself. You understand? Don't superimpose on someone else the standards of living that you have chosen for yourself. If it is doing it to you, that's because that's the way you live. But to someone else, $150 on a pair of sneakers is nothing. It's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. They don't care. About that. They have it like that. So don't say it's a spendthrift and use ayahs from the Quran or whatever the case may be to shame the person for providing the, you know, the quality of life that they feel is necessary for their child. You understand? You don't have that right. And you cannot superimpose on someone Islam because Islam is based upon, you know, what fits your lifestyle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Islam does not broad brush. Everybody has to live simplistically. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to see the traces of his blessings on his servants. You understand? We, we got this thing twisted, man. Woman taking upon herself to say, well, you know, I don't want, you're making my son materialistic. I don't want my child to be, you know, so in, impressed with the dunya or whatever the case may be. But your child's father, you know, that's the standard of living. It's not that he's going above and beyond to become materialistic. That's just the life that he lives. That's his life. That's the life that he can afford. Meanwhile, you separated from him. You worked from home. You got married because you didn't have any finances coming in and you're, you know, living off of your current husband's, you know, you know, paycheck. That's your choice. But you don't have to force this man's child to live under the quality of life that you have chosen for yourself. When he has an active father that is in his life that is still trying to provide for him as Allah commanded him to based upon what is ma'roof for him. You understand? When Allah says provide based upon what is ma'roof, based upon what is reasonable, reasonable to the one who is providing, not reasonable to the one who is the, you know, recipient of the provision. You are just the recipient. And I'm not saying because he's providing that he gets to decide, but if you feel at odds with him based upon what he's providing for the child, then that is a conversation you have with him, not something that you take upon yourself to deny the child, you know, because what you end up doing is causing a rift. You cause a rift. So you have a responsibility to the wealth of your spouse as well as your ex-spouse. Absolutely, then just leave it as that. Let's say he can buy the sneakers from now on. I'm not buying them. Well, he's giving you the money to buy the sneakers. It's not for you to, you know, intervene and say, well, I don't want this or I don't want that. You know, that's not your place. That's not your place. If he can afford it and that's what he's buying for his child, did not Allah command him to provide for his child based upon what was reasonable for him? And if that's reasonable for him, then why do you have a problem with it? Why is it a problem for you? Imam Ahmed Rahim Allah Ta'ala was asked about asceticism, a zuhud. And is zuhud wearing raggedy clothes and not caring about the world or whatever? No, some of these scholars were ascetics. They were zuhad. Abdullah bin Mubarak Rahim Allah Ta'ala who was wealthy beyond you know, what was normal for a scholar. And he wore the finest clothes. The finest garments made from the finest material. So we don't get to impose on somebody else what we believe is being too worldly. It's too worldly for you. It's relative, you understand? Or vice versa, or vice versa, or vice versa for the woman to want to provide for the child and the husband, you know, is saying, well, you know, that's too worldly or whatever. That's too worldly for you, not too worldly for me. That's the standard for me. <laughs> that's the standard for me. We, we, I don't accept anything less than that. That's the standard for me. It's too worldly for you. And then that's a conversation that we need to have as adults. You don't include my, my son in that. My son was anticipating getting Jordans. And so you go to the store and he's like, I want these Jordans. He's like, no, I'm not buying the Jordans. He's like, yeah, but my dad gave you the money for you to buy me some Jordans. I don't, I don't care what your father gave you. You know what I mean? That's dunya. That's worldly stuff. I'm not raising you to be like that. That's not your place. That's not your place. It's for you to have a conversation with the father. You know what I mean? It's for you to have a conversation with the father, but you have a responsibility to the wealth. And let's talk about for married people, people who are married. A man marries a woman who has money who has wealth, right? A lot of men go after women who have wealth and there's nothing wrong with that. That's normal. That's usually from the reasons that men marry women for their money. You understand? To, you know, to enjoy that, to be a part of that. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with women having money. However, if you marry a woman who has money, your responsibility is to not usurp that money, not manipulate her to give up that money, but to help her enhance that wealth 
that would provide for her a better living in this life as well as in the hereafter. As Allah says in the Quran, La tansa nasiba kamina dunya. Do not forget about your portion or your share of the dunya. That doesn't mean enjoy the dunya. That means take from the dunya, which will create a better home for you in the hereafter. But you gotta have dunya in order to do that. You understand? You gotta have dunya in order to do that. So some people say, oh no, that ayah means, you know, um, focus on the, on the akhirah. No, it doesn't. It means focus on this life and using this life to get you to the hereafter. But you got to have dunya in order to get that. <laughs> but, you know, as a man who marries a woman who has wealth, your responsibility is not to manipulate her to take the money from her. Your job is not to shame her for having money so that she ends up giving, wallah, well, I know situations of sisters who had money, Good jobs. Marry, you know, I don't want to say what I believe the brother is, you know what I mean? But marry this guy and he comes into her life and everything is haram, everything is haram, everything is haram until the woman literally gives up everything. Everything. Gave up everything because he shamed her, manipulated her on so many levels until she just eventually threw her hands up and said, you know what? To hell with it all. I'm quitting my job. I don't want the Birkin bag no more. I don't want this bag. I don't want that bag. It's, I don't want nothing. If that makes you happy, are you happy now? And I'm asking, you know, the brothers who've done that to their wives, are you happy now? You're not happy now because you're constantly looking for another wife, always looking for the next best thing. You shamed her. You manipulated her. You, you know, embarrassed her, made her feel embarrassed, right, for having, you know, wealth instead of coming in and helping her, you know, contain that wealth. That was going to be for your family, your children, legacy that you can help leave behind. But you want to leave behind just Quran and Sunnah, nothing else. And while leaving behind Quran and Sunnah is great, which is what you should do. But you should also, as the Prophet Wasallam said, not leave your children to beg of other people. And so the brother, he shames his wife. I know brothers who marry sisters who were on their way to getting their master's degree and doctor's degree, and they stopped. They stop because going to school is haram. Going to school is haram. You shamed her using the religion. Shame her to the point where, you know, she's, she started working from home and even working from home became a problem. She's on the phone too long. You know, you trying to read Quran. You know what I mean? She's disturbing you. Meanwhile, she's working, but you sitting on the couch trying to read Quran, trying to study, right? Sitting in your little, your little, your little space with all your books and you trying to study and she's on the phone, you know, medical biller, doing whatever she does, she's doing at home because you shamed her for working out in public. It's haram for her to work in public, in the public sector, right? Haram for her to work in public. She's around men, you know, 401k is haram, you know, all of these things, you found a way to manipulate her. So she gives up her job, she works from home. And now working from home is a problem. <laughs> working from home is a problem. To the point where she just doesn't work at all at this point. <laughs> she doesn't work at all anymore. So you went from being a woman who had her own thing, right? You went from being a woman who had her own thing, you know, had your own house, own car, you know, wearing, you know, three, four hundred dollar bags, you know, three hundred, four hundred dollar shoes, you know, plush overgarments, you know what I mean? Like you, you know, traveling, you know, you went from doing it all. To being a stay-at-home mom with wrinkled overgarments, slob stains, you know, milk stains all on your overgarment. And now your husband is looking for the next best wife. He's looking for the next best thing. This is massive manipulation. And, and it's, it's really sad, man. Now, I'm not telling you anything that's, you know, not real. This, this is real stuff I'm telling you. Real stuff. And it's like, why even get married? Because <laughs> you, you don't you're not looking for a wife. And for brothers like this, why not go marry somebody from another culture who enjoys just staying home, having babies, having baby after baby after baby, and they enjoy, they enjoy that. That's all they want to do. Because women, they hear this type of woman, she enjoys that too, but she also enjoys the finer things in life. There's, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the finer things in life. 
But your job marrying a woman with money is to come in and make her see how you can increase her wealth. Did not the Prophet ﷺ marry Khadija, who was one of the wealthiest women in Mecca? She was the most desired woman in Mecca. Everybody wanted to be married to Khadija. Everybody. And the Prophet ﷺ started working for Khadija. And when he started working for Khadija, her wealth increased. Which is what brought her attention to him. She would send him with merchandise from Mecca all the way to Syria. He gets to Syria because he's so honest. The honesty in Allah is putting the barakah in his business transactions. And he comes back from Syria to Mecca with more than what Khadija wanted. You understand? More than what she asked for. He didn't take a dime off the top. He didn't, you know, take mines off the top. I'm going to sell it for more. My wife is selling it for, for $10. I'm going to sell it for $15. i am going to take my five off the top and put it in my pocket. You know what I mean? Or I'm going to take my seven off the top and I'm going to give my wife eight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, he gave her everything back. He enhanced her wealth. He increased her wealth. That is what, we're, that is what our responsibility is. You understand? Not only did he increase her wealth, he showed her how to use her wealth in a manner that would build a home for her in the hereafter. After he married her and he became a prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he began freeing slaves. And guess where the money was coming from? Abu Bakr and from Khadija. Khadija would give him the money. I found someone who believes in me. Let's go free him. Khadija would break him off with the money. He would take the money and go and free. Go free him. Which is why when Aisha said, you know, why you marry, why you keep talking about Khadija and she's dead and Allah gave you someone better than her. The Prophet Sallallahu said, he did not give me somebody better than her. She believed in me when nobody else believed in me. You know, she gave me wealth, gave me money when everybody else denied me. He took her money and he showed her how to use it. Think about all of the hasanat that Khadija got as a result of assisting the Prophet Sallallahu in giving da'wah. Think about all of the hasanat for freeing the slave. Freeing slaves. Think about all of the hasanat that she got. You understand? You know, he took her wealth. Not only did he increase her wealth, he showed her how to invest that wealth. Financial investments. And, you know, suffice it to say that many men are not used to having money, so they marry women with money. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. So it's, it's, we have a responsibility, whether you're a man or a woman, you have a responsibility to be responsible for the wealth of your spouse. Number four, you are responsible for the soul of your spouse. You are responsible for that person's soul. We are spiritual creatures having a physical experience, not physical creatures having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual by nature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent that, you know, that, that soul down and placed that soul into that body by way of the angel at 120 days. Once that soul was put into that body, that soul is now on earth in this physical realm having a physical experience. Because the body, the physical body, is going to perish. It's going to die. It's going to go back to its essence. While the soul will continue on. And we have a responsibility with that soul. Not to break that soul. Not to scar that soul. Not to give that soul such a horrible human experience. Leave people better than what you found them. We want our, you know, souls, the person that we are married to, we want their souls to be tranquil. We want the soul to have a tranquil, peaceful experience. And in order for the soul coming into your life to have a very happy, healthy experience, you got to work on your soul. In order for the soul coming into your space to have a healthy experience, you got to work on your soul. You got to work on that. We want that soul to, you know, come into our space 
and be able to have the healthiest experience. And the only way that that can happen is when you begin working on your own soul. Struggling with yourself. Mujahid the nafs. Self-struggle. Fighting against your nafs. Fighting against your own soul. You understand? So you have a responsibility. And the responsibility that you have to the soul of your spouse is to work on your own soul. To work on your own energy. To work on your energy. So that the person that is coming into your space, that soul can feel that it's welcoming. Your space is welcoming. Your, that soul can feel, as the Prophet wasallam said, al arwah junud mujannada, that the souls are like conscripted soldiers. The souls are like soldiers. They will find each other, but you got to prep the space, right? You got to prep the space in which your soul resides in order to be welcoming to somebody else's soul. You got to prep that space. And the prepping starts with you working on your own soul. And your soul will naturally tell you whether that space is welcoming or not welcoming. You're married to someone and after being married to them, you just don't feel comfortable with the person. You, you've never felt completely at ease and completely comfortable being in the person's space. You never felt like that. And that is because the person did not do the necessary work to prepare the space for to welcome your soul into that space. You told the person during the sit down, you know, I pray five times a day. I fast the month of Ramadan. I read the Quran like I'm very serious about this stuff. And then you move in with the person. The person has a dog. The person got pictures all over the house. The person blasting music in the house. And you like. Dude, I told you. I did not did I not tell you that you know this is this this space ain't gonna work for me, man. This space is not gonna work for me. It's not gonna work for me. You know, your friends, your non-Muslim friends come over, all types of people come over, they don't make dua before they enter into the home. You invite in all types of shell team devils into the home. You know what I mean? Like you ever step into your home and you can feel that the energy in your home is completely off. And then you find out that your spouse had company over and you're like, damn, man, like, you know, like, this is my space. This is my space. How do you invite people over into our home? They didn't make dua before they entered the home. They didn't make dua before they exit the home. They left their devils here with them. You know what I mean? And now you got to go play sort of the You got to go make a couple of rakas trying to get the person, get that energy out of your home. You have a responsibility to the soul of your spouse. You have a responsibility. You think about, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and welcoming the women into his life. You know, he was a man who used to get up at night and pray and his feet would bleed. You know, the narration mentioned that he married Maimuna. Maimuna was his uncle's wife's sister, was Abbas's sister. Uh, Abbas's wife's sister. So Abbas was married to a woman and May the Prophet Sallallahu was married to Maimuna and Maimuna and Abbas's wife were sisters. So his uncle and him are married to two sisters. He goes to Maimuna's house, right? He goes to Maimuna's house and he's spending the night there. And his nephew, I mean his cousin, Abba Ibn Abbas, Wants to come spend the night with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My, my, you know, my cousin is spending the night at my aunt's house. You understand? My cousin is spending the night at my aunt's house. And my cousin just so happened to be Prophet Muhammad. So I want to go spend the night at my aunt's house so I can spend time with my cousin. But when he got to Maimuna's house, his aunt's house, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got up at night to pray. So Ibn Abbas, he said, you know, I'm going to go pray. You know, I'm, I'm hanging out with my cousin at my aunt's house and I'm going to go pray with my cousin. He's praying at night. And he began praying alongside the Prophet Wasallam. The Prophet started reciting, you know, Surah to Nisa. Surah number four, 200 and some odd ayats, right? And then he went from Surah to Nisa to Ali Imran, Surah number three. <laughs> and Ibn Abbas started to get tired and he's saying to himself, as the narration mentioned, he said, I wish I had never stood alongside the Prophet because I didn't know that this was that serious. I didn't know this guy used to stand up the entire night reciting some of the longest surahs in the Quran. 
And this hadith also, the scholars extract from this hadith the permissibility of reciting one surah before the other. The surahs do not have to be recited in the order in which they are in the Quran. However, the ayats do. You cannot recite the ayats backwards. The ayats have to be recited as they are in the surah. But you do not have to recite one surah before the other one based upon their order in the Quran. So in one raka'ah, I can recite, you know, from this portion of the Quran and another uh, raka'ah, I can recite from another portion of the Quran. There's, there's no obligation. All right. But the point that I'm making is that the Prophet Sallallahu got up at night and prayed. He's prepping. This is the woman that he married and he's bringing that spiritual energy with him into her home that I'm going to stand up at night. This is my usual practice. So the, given the fact that you married me, I'm going to bring my spiritual practices with me into your home. So I'm going to stand up at night and I'm going to pray. And Maimuna was behind him praying. So that means that the Prophet Sallallahu was praying. Ibn Abbas was praying alongside of him. And Maimuna, his wife, was praying behind him. This is prepping the space. You have a responsibility to the soul of the one that you are married to. You guys follow me? I, I hope that that's clear. I hope that that's understood. All right. And when you start to see that your soul is troubled, then it becomes your responsibility to start to remove yourself from the person that you love so that you don't begin to trouble their soul. There are a, a lot of troubled souls in our communities. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring peace and solace and tranquility to those troubled souls. There are souls amongst us right now as we speak that are troubled. And what I mean by troubled souls, I mean souls that are, you know, experiencing, you know, turmoil. They're experiencing turmoil. Either they're being tested, either they're succumbing to, you know, the, the pressures that are around them, you know, succumbing to the whispers of shaitan. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy upon you. May Allah make it easy on all of us. But if you know that your soul is troubled, if you know that your soul is troubled right now, you're experiencing some internal turmoil, you know, some internal dysfunction, internal, you know, your soul is not at ease, then it becomes a responsibility that you don't now begin to project that onto your spouse. You, you guys follow me? Don't project that onto your spouse. That's, that, they don't deserve that. There's nothing worse than one troubled soul other than two troubled souls. You understand? If I'm going through something, then I need to find a way to cushion you from whatever troubles I'm going through. You don't deserve that. You understand? And some people don't, you know, the line is blurred. When I'm going through troubled times, you know, within my soul, that trickles over into you too. You got to experience it too. And that's not fair. That's not fair. Okay, two more. You are responsible for the religion of your spouse. You are responsible for the religion of your spouse. To teach your spouse, Dean, the best way you know how. Teaching your spouse about Islam is not always grab a book, grab a pen and paper, take some notes and let's sit down and let's have a dance. Let's have a lesson. Teaching your spouse about Dean is actually more effective when you just simply practice it. If you follow me. Teaching your spouse about the religion is actually more effective when you just simply practice the religion and they are around you and they can see the religion, you know, practically being implemented. When they came to the house of Aisha, and they asked her, what was the character of the Prophet like? What was his character like? And Aisha, she asked him, she said, don't you read the Quran? She said, His character was the Quran. He was the Quran in motion. And that is the way that the Prophet ﷺ was more effective with teaching. It wasn't just about, you know, hey, go pull out a book. Let me sit down and let me teach you Islam. He was more effective with, you know, this, you know, informal teaching. 
his informal teaching practices by just simply implementing the religion himself. But there were times in which Aisha would ask him questions. Why is this? Why is that? And the Prophet ﷺ would explain sometimes using, you know, verses from the Quran, sometimes using metaphors, sometimes, you know, he would teach his wife and vice versa. Aisha would teach the Prophet ﷺ things. Aisha would teach the Prophet Sallallahu things. So this is, you know, you have a responsibility to protect the religion of your spouse. Not to steal the religion from your spouse. And what do I mean by that? There's some people who go into marriages and they believe that my practice of Islam is better than your practice of Islam. My practice of Islam is more authentic than your practice of Islam. My practice of Islam is the way to practice Islam. Meanwhile, dismissing everything that you bring to the table. Oh, we're not supposed to do that. Oh, that's a bit of, that's an innovation. We don't do this, we don't do that, right? That's not teaching. What you're doing is you're dismissing all of the religious experiences that your spouse has been raised upon, right? To the point where your spouse starts to say, well, Maybe I just got it wrong altogether. Everything that I do seems to be wrong to you. <laughs> Sometimes this happens when, you know, one spouse was born and raised Muslim. Some, sometimes this happens when one spouse was born and raised Muslim and the other one is a convert. Sometimes this happened when one, you know, came from a particular, you know, method, methodology or particular approach to Islam whether they, they were raised in the Sufi community, they were raised in the, you know, Ansar, Ansar cult or raised wherever, you know what I mean? We don't get to choose who our parents are. We don't get to choose what type of religious experience our parents gave us. And if we marry someone who has a different approach to Islam, your job is not to dismiss my entire experience. Your job is to help me sort through Sift through. I'm not throwing the... We don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't need to dismiss your spouse's entire experience in order for you, you know, to give them the stamp of approval. Now you're valid. You know what I mean? No. Because there's certain things that your spouse is probably not going to stop doing anyway. It's embedded in them. It's ingrained in them. So some things, you know, you, you have a responsibility to protect the religion of your spouse and to make the religious experience of your spouse one to enhance that, to make it one that is, you know, better than the way that you found them. Not to dismiss their religious experience and make them feel like, well, everything, I've ta everything I was taught must have been wrong. So why don't I just take all of the religious experiences that I've had in my life Throw them out the window and let me just clear my mind and then you can just reteach me Islam. That's not the way that it works. The Prophet ﷺ, you got to understand, he married a woman who was Jewish, Sophia. He married, you know, a younger woman who was not even mentally ready to receive some of the commandments on the level that he gave to other people. He married, you know what I mean? He married women from different walks of life. He married Sauda, who was the older woman, Maimuna, who was the older woman. He married, you know, Um Salama and Um Habiba who had children before him. He married women from different levels, different social levels, different educational levels, different intellectual levels, different levels of maturity and security. And he had to meet each and every one of them where they were. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't deal with Aisha the way that he dealt with Um Salama. He didn't deal with Zainab, you know what I mean, who used to say that, you know, to his other wives, all of your fathers married y'all to the prophet, but Allah married me to the prophet. You know, she, she had a level of bougie with her, if I could use that term. She had a level of bougie with her. And he didn't deal with her the way that he dealt with his other wives. Zayda was bougie, without a doubt. Which is why she separated from Zayd. Zayd was a slave. She's, there's no way that that relationship was going to last. No way that that, that was going to last. You know what I mean? But at the same token, he dealt with each and every individual, teaching them Islam, meeting them where they were. You know what I mean? Meeting them where they were. And that's a skill that some people just simply don't have. 
You marry the person and you expect them to just forget about everything they ever learned about Islam. And now you're going to reteach them the religion. And obviously, if you're going to reteach someone Islam, there's a lot of biases that you have because the reteaching of Islam that you are giving your spouse serves your agenda. <laughs> obviously, it serves your agenda. So, you know, we have a responsibility to protect the religion of our spouse. The Prophet Sallallahu said to his companions, in the minkum from amongst you are those who chase people away from the religion. And so unfortunately, some of us have been married to people who have actually chased us away from the religion. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, many of us have been married to people who have chased us away from the religion. The Prophet Sallallahu said, In the minkum la munafirin, from amongst you are those who chase people away from the religion. Deen chasers, <laughs> meaning that you are chasing people away from the deen. Not dream chasers, deen chasers. <laughs> chasing people away from the deen. You're not chasing deen, you're chasing people away from the deen. The Prophet Sallallahu was, you know, very simplistic. He said, any woman who prays her five daily prayers, who fasts her month of Ramadan, who um, willfully um, complies with the request of her husband, it will be said to her, enter into Jannah through any of the gates that you choose. The woman's life in Islam is very simple, very simplistic. So, you know, it's very important that, you know, we have a responsibility to, and, and the same thing goes for some women. You have brothers, right? You have brothers who come in, you know, and are very enthusiastic about the religion. They love Islam, love the deen. Get up for Fajr. You know, they're at the masjid, you know, as much as they can be. They love the deen, love Islam. And then they marry a woman who feels like, you know, your enthusiasm is a bit extreme. So I need to dumb you down a little bit. I need to water you down. I need to dilute you because your enthusiasm, and it's, it's sad because it's like the only reason why you want to dilute your husband is because you are just too lazy to have the same zeal and enthusiasm about Islam. You are too lazy. Here it is. He was single before he married you or he was previously married and he began working on himself getting to the masjid, getting there on time, making all of his salats, you know, making dhikr after the salat, having his share of the Quran that he reads every day, very zeal, uh, you know, overzealous, very enthusiastic about Islam. Love the deen. Love the deen. And then he marries a woman who's just too lazy to build that type of enthusiasm and she begins to dilute him little by little by little. Little by little by little. Until there's nothing left. Got him listening to music. Got him, you know, doing lying and doing all types of haram. And this guy, you know, you, you don't got to pray every night. Get in the bed with me. He's like, well, I want to get up and pray. You're making him, you know, compromise his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Compromising his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meanwhile, before he met you, you know what I mean? He was zealous about the religion, enthusiastic, loved the dean. And every time he gets into a conversation with you, it's about, oh, how horrible the Muslim community is, how horrible Muslims are, how bad of an experience with Islam you're having. And the more and more he's exposed to that, the more and more you are diluting his enthusiasm, his zeal about Islam. Until there's nothing left, until he's like you, or until he's worse than you. And now that puts you in the upper hand position. Because now you can say to him, you know, honey, you need to fear Allah. Honey, you need to do this. Honey, you need to do that. But when you first married him, you didn't need to tell him to do that. You didn't need to tell him to do that. Now you're in the privileged position because he's worse than you now. You've diluted him. You've dumped him down so much. That now you get to tell him the fear of Allah. MashaAllah. 
Allah says in the Quran, and these are the days that we rotate between the people. One day you're on top and I'm on the bottom. Next day you're on the bottom and I'm on top. That's how it works. But you have some people who systematically, systematically figure out ways in which they can dilute you. But you have a responsibility to maintain the religion of the person. You see, you marry someone and they're overzealous. They're overzealous about the religion. They're enthusiastic about Islam. She, she came into the marriage. She's wearing niqab. You know, not because you told her to, because she wants to. And then you shame her and blame her. Could you please take that off? You know, my family is very uncomfortable with that. It's like, no, nah, she came in wearing niqab. Enc encourage that. That's what she wants to do. That's my queen. She can wear whatever the hell she want to wear. She want to wear a niqab. I'm going to make sure that everybody accept that. <laughs> coming through. Woman with niqab coming through. Move out the way. Your family come to you. Well, don't you think it's a little uncomfortable that she comes to family gatherings and she's still covering her face? Listen, that is my queen. She wear whatever she want to wear. And I'm in full support of that. I'm not going to make her compromise that. She don't want other men, family members or not looking at her in her face, staring her in her face. And I completely support that 100 percent. And I'm not going to ask my wife to compromise. And if my wife is not welcome, then I'm not welcome. You understand? That's how that works. If my wife is un, if you make my wife uncomfortable, you make me uncomfortable. If my wife is not welcome to a family gathering, then I'm not welcome to a family gathering. That's the way that that works. You understand? I'm not asking my wife to take off her niqab. I'm not doing that. I'm not asking my wife to dump herself down, dilute her, you know, religious zeal and enthusiasm. Man, I love that. I love the fact that my wife is, you know, overzealous about the religion, is enthusiastic about the religion. I feed off of that because sometimes I'm not as zealous and enthusiastic about the religion. So I feed off of her energy. I need that. You understand? When you dilute your spouse's enthusiasm for the religion, you are only doing yourself a disservice. Because what happens when both of y'all are dumbed down, diluted? You understand? You're only hurting yourself when you do that. One of you got to remain here, you know, so when the other one is, you know, not necessarily there, the other one can feed off the other's energy. You understand? Don't, don't let nobody, you know, dilute you, man. Don't, don't let anybody take that away from you, man. And if you're married to someone who doesn't respect your religious practices, then you need, to, you, need, you need to question yourself, why are you even with this person? Because it seems like you're trying to make me more like you instead of trying to make me a better me. You understand? You're trying to make me more like you instead of trying to make me a better me. That is your job. And the last thing that you are responsible for with your marriage is your spouse's emotions. And we all have enough time to get in that. And we, we've already talked about, you know, emotional intelligence. You understand, we already talked about emotional intelligence, but you are responsible for the emotions of your spouse to validate those emotions. And if you are emotionally ignorant or unintelligent, then you need to get on the ball. You need to, you know, bring yourself up to speed. Um, but I'm not going to go into the whole emotions thing because we've already covered that. All right. So six things that you need to be responsible for if you are ready for marriage. You need to be responsible for the mental well-being of your spouse. You're responsible for the life of your spouse, both physical, emotional and spiritual. You're responsible for the wealth of your spouse. You're responsible for the soul of your spouse. You're responsible for the religion of your spouse. And you're responsible for the emotions of your spouse. You are responsible. If you feel like this is too much for you, then you're probably not ready for marriage. Or you might want to go into a marriage with someone who feels exactly the way you feel. We don't need all of that. As Mae West said, that I am in love with the idea of marriage, but not the, marriage is a great institution, but I'm not ready for an institution. So if you feel the same way Mae West felt, right, in that quote that I gave at the beginning, that you're not ready for an institution, then you might want to find somebody who's not ready for an institution as well. Right. You might want to find somebody who just doesn't want to be in an institution of marriage, just wants the, you know, the fluff of marriage, the idea of two people being together until, you know, they decide not to be together anymore. If that's what you're looking for, there's tons of people out there who are, you know, on that level. 
there's tons of people out there on that level, but you need to just be transparent about what you're looking for when you're going into these sit downs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Um, so on Wednesday, we probably will not have uh, discussion. We may do it tomorrow instead of Wednesday. Uh, I'll put a post out later, uh, later on today um, and let you guys know whether or not we'll do it tomorrow or Wednesday. But I doubt we do it on Wednesday. We may do it tomorrow or we may do it Thursday. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Uh, I'll take a couple of minutes for questions, inshallah. If you have any questions related to the topic, Periscope, I'll open you up again uh, and remove, um, uh, start the chat, inshallah.